Welcome to Friends and Neighbors. I'm Sherry Tatum, uh, your host for the day. And, uh, you know, a lot of times on the show we have a lot of inspiring programs, so a lot of shows that uh, build faith. And today is one of those. Uh, we have our guest, Bob Kretsch. And Bob is the author of 30 books, uh, two national bestsellers. But the one that we're going to be talking uh, to Bob about is called a little faith. Uh, it's a father's miracle story of faith, hope, love, and a micro preemie. Uh, and when I say preemie, I mean preemie. She did not even weigh a pound. Uh, their daughter was born and weighed just somewhat under a pound. And that's what we're going to be talking with Bob about, that journey of, that, of their daughter and what happened, and then how the book, A Little Faith, came about. So, Bob, welcome to Friends and Neighbors. How are you? Well, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for being with us. Your story is absolutely inspiring. I'm, I'm just looking through it, but I can't wait to read uh, all the different things that, that God did for you and your wife, Karen. Uh, now, tell me what happened... Karen was pregnant, everything was fine, and then all of a sudden, uh, at what stage or what month was she was Karen in when you had to take her to the hospital? Yeah, Karen was 22 weeks pregnant and doing great, felt fine. Um, but one morning she had a little bit of bleeding. So she called the doctor who said, well, it's not unusual, but let's check it out. So she went over, or we went over, uh, nurse took a look at her, said, you look great, your weight's great, let's do an exam. She hooked her up to the monitor and then said, Karen, are you feeling contractions? And Karen said, no, She because it looks like you might be having some. So let's get the doctor in. He came in, did an exam and said, all right, you are having contractions. You've begun to dilate. I want you to go directly to the hospital. I'll meet you there. He said, but before you go, I need you to sit down because I want to tell you about this. So he sat down and he said, so we're going to try to hold off this birth. He said, but I'm going to have to say, it looks like the baby will be born within a week. And it's unlikely the baby will be born alive. Oh, my. Yeah. So we were shocked, but <coughs> we went to the hospital. They held off the birth for two days. Then Karen's water broke and uh, the baby was born. Now, the baby was born alive, which just, you know, we were thrilled. Yes. But she was the smallest human I'd ever seen. She would fit in the palm of her hand. And she was quickly whisked into a group of nurses surrounded by machines. And the neonatologist came over to Karen and said, you know, Karen, how are you, how are you doing? And Karen said, I'm fine. How's the baby? So she said, mm -hmm. your baby is very sick. She's very small. She's not breathing on her own. We're keeping her going with machines. Um, the oh. best we can do really is to give her to you. You hold her, keep her warm as she passes on. Oh, and my. So they were not giving you any hope at all that your daughter would live, would make it through. No, Mar I, I just blurted, you're kidding. And oh. she said, no, this baby weighs under a pound, and babies like this don't make it. Mm. And we said, aren't you even going to try? And then she looked at us, and she said, all right, I'll take her to the NICU at your direction. We said, okay, let's do that. So all of a sudden, the baby, all the nurses, the machines are all whisked out of the room, uh, Karen had lost some blood, so they brought her to the OR. And I left to go bring her stuff back to her room. And I ran into her obstetrician in the hallway, and I said, you know, the baby was born alive. And he said, 
look, Bob, don't get your hopes up. You know, she's born alive, but this does not look good. And I said, oh. all right. He said, Still but, no hope. No one is giving you any hope. No. How terrible. Oh, my. So he said, you can go to the NIC and see the baby. They're expecting you. I said, well, that's great. So I went in, and she was in a tray with a big heat lamp over top of her, surrounded by this group of nurses. And she was just skin and bones, wires and tubes, and, you know, kind of just tight and straining. And so I saw the neonatologist. I said, how's the baby? She goes, she said, she's still not breathing on her own. We're giving her 100% oxygen. And she started telling me, you know, if we can't get her off of this, she could be blind. She could have retardation, cerebral palsy. All these things can happen, but we're trying to keep her going. And she is hanging in there. And then she said, we've just got to keep praying. And all of a sudden, I felt like, okay, this woman's on my side. And she said, if the baby can make 24 hours, her chances will improve dramatically. And if she can make 72 hours, we would consider her viable. And I asked her, what do you mean viable? viable. Yeah. And she said, that means that she has a chance. Oh. So I'm thinking, well, that means right now she doesn't. But, you know, for the next two days, it was the same thing. We stayed at the hospital, the same report every day. You know, she's, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad but she's hanging in there. And Karen was discharged. We went home and I was praying, you know, by the side of my bed, kneeling, praying and just saying, please keep her alive. Please save her. Um, and I was not, you know, I went to church, but it was more of a checklist kind of thing for me. I didn't study the Bible. I wasn't in a small group. I didn't really have a strong relationship with God. And I didn't feel I was connected. I didn't feel peace. Right. But, I, but I got up and I went and looked out the back window. And all of a sudden, like two pieces of verses dropped into my head. I don't know how else to explain it. It wasn't a voice. I didn't study the Bible, but I heard enough in church, I guess, that a couple of things stuck. And one of them was, have faith as a mustard seed and you can move a mountain. Amen. And the other was, knock and you'll be answered, seek and you will find. Oh, wow. These two verses came to me, and I thought, this is important. I grabbed the one Bible we had in the house. I didn't even know where to look. I was just flipping through it aimlessly. But I did have a friend who was at seminary, and I called him. And I said, Greg, I have these two pieces of verses. Where are they? He goes, oh, that's, you know, Matthew 7 and Matthew. <laughs> yeah. And it, it right away. And I looked it up. And I read the verses, and I knelt back down, and I began to pray to God. I said, God, you know, you gave us these promises, and I'm claiming these promises. I know you'll hear me, and you'll be with me. And if I just have a little faith, and please give me faith, you know, we can make this happen. Right. And so all of a sudden, for the first time since it all started, I felt some peace. I felt that God was with me, and I was so thankful. And we went back to the hospital, and she's still hanging in. She made, you know, the 72-hour mark. In fact, I went to the nurse that night, and I was all proud. I said, so she made 72 hours. Yeah. I said, yeah. yeah. Now she's, but she, she said, now she's got like a 30% chance. Oh. We were thinking one in three. What did, how did, oh, my gosh, how did you feel at, at that moment? Did you still have hope? Bob? I did, because I, I felt like oh. God's presence after that prayer, I felt like he's with us. He can make this happen. He can make anything happen. Um, in fact, that night when I went home, I had a dream. Now, I'm not the kind of person that has a lot of dreams or permanent. <laughs> yeah. Really, This was the one and only. But in the dream, I was in the NICU with faith. She was in her warmer tray. Nobody else was there except there was one nurse and a nurse who looked like she was in an old fashioned nurse's hat, you know, big white hat and a white outfit. And she felt like a warmth around her, like a light and a warmth. And I went near her, but I knew I couldn't get too near. And she just said to me, she smiled a little. She goes, Faith, 
is going to be all right. And I remember saying, thank you. And I felt so good. In fact, I woke up and I had that same feeling of warmth and contentment. And I said, wow. Um, but I didn't tell anybody. And I didn't even tell Karen because I didn't want to say, oh, I had a dream. Everything was going to be all right. I didn't want people to think, OK, he's lost it. But uh, it reassured me again. Gave you hope. Oh, Finally, yeah. you, you got some hope, Bob. Yeah. Yes. Up, up to that point in my life, I'd been the kind of person who thought, you know, whatever I want to make happen, I could make it happen. You know, um, if a child is sick, you bring them to the right doctor, the right hospital, it can be fixed. But in this case, they were all telling us, no, it's not going to work. She's not going to make it. Um, and I felt helpless. And I finally, for the first time in my life, just turned everything over to God and said, you know, you can do this. I can't. Whatever your will is, let it be done. But please help us. Amen. And he did help you. You well, know, I, I, I feel like sometimes we, when we go through hard times, is when we're the uh, closest to the Lord. It's when we really, truly say, okay. I'm in. I'm all the way in. I may have been out here a little bit, but now I'm, I'm in. And I'm here to do your will. And your will be done in my life, you know, from here on out, because I'm, I'm yours 100%. And it seems to me that this is what happened to you, Bob, during this. Uh, I don't know whether to try, uh, call it a trial or, or a test, but God used it for good. The Bible says that the devil meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant every bit of this for the good for you, for Karen, for faith, and now for many others that are watching and listening to you and how this journey with faith, how it all came out. Now, we're talking about the first couple of nights here, I think. So yeah. how after, after your dream and you have this nurse that says she has 30% chance what has evolved? What evolved after that? So there was a lot of ups and downs. Um, she got two different infections. And the infections can be very deadly. Yes. But again, she overcame them. Uh, she had a heart valve that was open that needed to be closed. Mm -hmm. you know, and they started talking about maybe surgery, but we're going to try this, this drug instead. It was called Indocin. And to, but the drug had side effects that could be dangerous, could cause bleeds. Um, so we were praying over that constantly. And, you know, the drug worked, the valve closed, her heart was fine. Um, wow. You know, we were there for four months with her. Um, and like I said, there was back and forth, up and down, but prayer was our constant. And for me, who, you know, I had never really, like I said, never read the Bible before. All of a sudden, I was hungering for the word. You know how they say that? Praise God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was so real. For the first time, I wanted to read the Bible and learn as much as I could. And the more I read, the more I felt reassured you know, that God was with us. And Well, in those four months that you were there, say a couple of months down the road here, uh, did your faith ever wane? Did Karen's wane? Did you ever just say, Oh, God, I'm so tired. Can we just get through this? I know you must have been exhausted mentally and physically and Karen, too. So how did you get through that part of it? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I never felt exhausted yeah. um, because every day was just a gift. I felt like Amen. another day, like it was just wonderful. Just had all this adrenaline because she just kept hanging in there every day, getting better, getting stronger. You know, weight gain was a big deal for her because she weighed less than a pound and her weight was gaining really slowly. But they have to be careful as to how much nutrition they can give the baby because if you give too much, their intestines are not ready to handle it. Right. And, you know, they could have serious problems. But one of the good things was that Karen was able to pump milk for her. I was, would, I, I was going to ask you that, did, uh, because the mother's milk, is, it has so much in, in that that is healing, that is good for the child. So she was able to do that. 
and yeah, they gave the milk uh, to Faith. Yeah, she was able to freeze it, and then they would add it to formula, and then they would, you know, feed it to her through a tube. And so that was great because Karen was involved that way. In fact, at first, I thought the nurses were going to want us like to keep us at a distance, but they kept encouraging us, you know, touch the baby, talk to the baby, um, because the research shows that the more you're involved with the child, the better they do. Chance, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, quickly. to to know to hear your voice even. Uh, you know, and, and your touch. Uh, they say that that's healing for a, a preemie. Um, I had a cousin, a niece, that was born uh, a little over a pound. And I know what you're talking about because uh, m the mother, Haley, would go in every day and, and they would have her touch her. And she did uh, uh, the milk also but and talked to her. So mm -hmm. the voice... Uh, has a lot to do with it, I think, touch also. But in, in this, Bob, through this journey, did, did, it, did you start to believe in miracles, maybe? Because we all need miracles at different times, don't we? I did, yeah, for sure. <laughs> we have to have miracles, in, and we serve a miracle work in God. So why did you want to write your story? Why, why did you want to share your book? Yeah, I felt like compelled to do it. I felt God had given me this miracle. I needed to share it with as many people as I could. You know, there's a Psalm 96, 3. It says, you know, actually in the New Living Translation, it says, publish his glorious word. It uses the verb publish. Um, I figured I can do that. I'm a writer. God's given me that gift. And then he gave me his miracle. Um, it's kind of my job now to share it. Amen. Well, what do you have any advice? I, I'm sure there's someone watching that would need some of your advice on what do you do this when the minute that baby's born and you're faced with all those obstacles, you know it's going to be a rough road ahead. So do you have any advice for maybe their young parents and mm -hmm. they just need a word of encouragement maybe? Yeah, I mean, turn to God, you know, give it to God, seek his help and his wisdom in prayer, and then also be involved, you know, like we were talking about, touch the baby, talk to the baby. One of the nurses told me early on, she said, this baby knows your voices from in the womb. Yes, absolutely. Every two weeks. In fact, she said, make some tape recordings. So I went out and bought a little tape recorder. You know, it looked like a little James Bond thing that could fit in your hand. <laughs> yeah. We made tapes of us singing and reading books and things. So we, when we weren't there, they would put this tape recorder in her warmer and play our voices. So we'd be there even more than we could physically be there. So, you know, don't be scared. Be involved. The nurses want you involved. In fact, when Faith was leaving the hospital, finally, um, she weighed five pounds. There was a little party for her there. Nurses had cake and the doctors and everybody. And one of the nurses uh, was near me. And I said, you know, you guys were wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, I know God used you and you did it. You know, you saved her life. And well, she's, she she's, said, hey, remember, God used you too. Amen. Well, Bob... Gosh, we have to go. I'm out of time. I wish we had two more hours to speak about your book and about faith, but we have to go. I want to thank you so much for sharing your story, and I hope maybe you can come back and be with us again. But thank you, and uh, stay with us here on Friends and Neighbors. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Friends and Neighbors, and uh, I would like to end the today's show with a, just a little devotional, uh, maybe something that might spark your uh, journey with the Lord, maybe to be uh, a little closer to the Lord. Uh, and if you have a Bible, Matthew 26, 
and it's when Jesus had been play, praying, you know, in Gethsemane, and that the Lord's will be done, not his. And he gets up, and Peter and the disciples, of course, they're all asleep, uh, which, uh, you know, they said they would watch and, and pray with the Lord. But this is about when the, the uh, soldiers came uh, to take Jesus away. And it said, in that sa same, starting with verse 55, in that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they that laid, him, laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, at a distance, uh, into the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now, he's gone in to the high priest's office, which was the enemies of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says he followed Jesus at a distance. And that's what I want to talk to you about, uh, following Jesus at a distance. How... How do you know that you are following Jesus at a distance? Let me give you a few little pointers here. It says, when we know to do good and do it not. The Bible says that. It says, if you know to do good and do it not, to you it's sin. So that's at a distance. You're, you're, you're keeping part of yourself uh, for self to do what you want to do. And that is following Jesus Christ at a distance. You're not following the precepts upon precepts in this Bible. When we love this world more than God or Jesus, uh, when the world takes precedence in all of its entertainment, what we go see, what we listen to, how we dress, how we talk, uh, where we go, uh, you know, if we let entertainment uh, of this world uh, entice us, even though, you know, the words that, that, are, that are in a movie or a TV show, terrible words, taking God's name in vain, the F word, all these words, and you sit and listen to that, that grieves the Holy Spirit in you. So that, when you let the love of this world, you love it more than you love Jesus Christ and doing the right thing. And when you don't gather with your brothers and sisters at church, but you prefer to stay home. Listen, the Bible says in the latter days, assemble yourselves even more because uh, our, the, the days are wicked and they're short. And so when we gather with our brothers and sisters, we gain strength. Uh, you know, we can encourage one another. That's why we are to assemble ourselves. I know there's times that, you know, we cannot go to church. Maybe we're sick or something, uh, an emergency has come up. But if you can go to a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving church and be with your sisters and brothers, you will see a difference in your growth in the Lord. So always, uh, you know, gather with your brothers and sisters. It'd be a great help to you. And when you had rather be in the company of non-believers, uh, you had rather go somewhere else and be with people that aren't like-minded, that do things that uh, the Bible says that mm, maybe that's not a good thing to do, uh, but, but you find that you'd rather be with them. You're following at a distance. Uh, we should be with the body of Christ. Uh, you know, not saying that you can't have friends that aren't sinners because we're to witness to the sinners, of course. But be with your brothers and sisters. Be with the body of Christ, praying with each other. Maybe have Bible study. Maybe, you know, uh, go to church together. Have uh, families over to your house and, and do Christian things. You know, you, you want to that. And when you let the world distort your values, when, just like I said, when you know to do good and don't do it to you, it's wrong. Don't let the world distort how you dress, how you look, how you talk, where you go, what you listen to. Let this Word of God here, this Bible, uh, be your guide. If you let this Word get into your heart and you follow that, you'll be on the right path and your life will be blessed. I know it happened for me. Jesus Christ and His Word 
made an entirely difference in my life. And when you question the authority of Scripture and you look to your own will, you're following Jesus at a distance. As a believer, we're supposed to be up close with God. We're supposed to be personal with Jesus. We're supposed to have that relationship with Jesus Christ and Him crucified because He did so much for us. We should be willing, you know, uh, to sacrifice a few things that, that we love so that we can be closer to our Lord. Now, what do you want to be like? I have all my notes here, as you can see. But, you know, it says that Peter followed Jesus at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. That's in Matthew 26. and Because he, he wanted to see the outcome. Uh, he became an observer instead of a participant. Be a participant. Be, a, be involved. Be involved in your church. Be involved in a Bible study. Be involved in helping your neighbors. Be involved with Christianity. Be that ambassador that you're called to be. Be that witness that God has called you to be uh, in, in a world that has gone astray. We certainly need uh, all, that we, all the Christians to be involved in this, these last days where I feel like we are. So do you want to be like Peter? who was a roller coaster. He's up one minute and down the other. Uh, he, he said one minute he'll die for Christ, then he's, he's uh, fled, and then he's following at a distance. One minute he says, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you always, and then he's asleep while Jesus is praying. No, you don't want to be like that. You want to be that one that's right beside him. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. Follow him. Follow him closely, and you'll hear his instruction. You'll hear his voice. So which Peter are you going to be like? Thank God Peter woke up and started following Jesus more closely. So I think all of that that he went through, his denial of Jesus and all that led him to a closer walk. So think about it. Which Peter do you want to be? I hope the one that follows real close. I hope you know him as Savior. And here at uh, Friends and Neighbors, we love you. We hope to see you next time here on Friends and Neighbors.